Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment, but has passed from death to life. Truly, truly, I say to you, an hour is coming and is now here when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son also to have life in himself. And he has given him authority to execute judgment because he is the Son of Man. This is the word of God for the people of God. All right. I'm just going to pop this off. We're going we're to figure this out as we go. And so as I was preparing this week for this sermon, um, I'm not going to lie to you, I was kind of nervous. Um, I, I had the amazing opportunity for this past week to be in Estes Park, Colorado at a men's retreat. This is my fourth year, I'm pretty sure, and I've told myself that if things go to plan, I will never miss this retreat for the rest of my life. And that is how important it is to me, my personal life. It's how important it is to my f- own faith. And possibly most important of all is I know whenever I come back, I become a better husband and a better father and a better minister to those who I have the chance to be in ministry with. And there was this passage, actually first, I'm going to admit something. I told, I told first service this. I'm, I'm going to admit something to y'all that I'm pretty sure I'm not supposed to admit whenever I'm about to give a sermon. And it's that as of, let's see, about five hours ago, my sermon has completely changed from what I originally planned on it being. And I think that's a good thing. Um, this whole past week while I was at this men's retreat, there was this passage that was kept, kept constantly coming back to me. I kept thinking about it. It kept being on my heart. And I thought that at some point I was going to get to share it at men's retreat. I thought that's why I kept coming back to it. And on the last night of our worship, I thought there was going to be a, a time at some point where I was going to share. And for some reason, that moment just never came. I think that's because I was supposed to share it with you all today. Um, if you have your Bibles or your phone, I would love for you to join with me because it's not going to be on the screen. Because like I said, this was all planned out just a few hours ago. And in, I'm going to be reading from Mark chapter 9, verses 14 through 27. Again, that's Mark chapter 9, verses 14 through 27. And as you find that, um, we are continuing our series what we believe. This is a a catechism series that we're doing, the foundations of our faith, and today we're talking about heaven and hell are real. This is a heavy topic. This is is a topic that should not be taken lightheartedly because it is a truth and a foundation of our faith that heaven and hell are real. During children's time in first service, I asked them, what do you think heaven looks like? And we had some great answers. We, of course, heard clouds. We heard God and Jesus. We heard perfect, which those were some great answers. And some of the also great answers was golden chicken nuggets. Um, Spa music was a great one. And it is so great to see these kids know that heaven is real. And so in this passage that we're about to read in in Mark chapter 9 is what comes right before this is the transfiguration of Jesus. This is where Jesus takes Peter, James, and John up to a high mountain and he is transfigured. It says that that he shone, he he shined brightly, and it says that his his divinity coming through. This is for Peter, James, and John to see that Jesus really is who he says he was. That he is the son of God and he is divine. This is his eternal glory appearing here on heaven. And so right after that passage, after that story, we find ourselves here in chapter 9, verses 14. 
and Jesus is coming down off the mountain with his disciples. And he comes into his town where the, uh, his other disciples already are, and there's a great crowd, and it says they're arguing. There's scribes are arguing, there's people arguing. And then they see Jesus coming down, and they run up and greet him. And now join me in chapter 16 when Jesus asked. He asked them, what are you arguing about with them? And someone from the crowd answered him, Teacher, I brought my son to you, for he has a spirit that makes him mute. And whenever it seizes him, it throws him down, and he foams and grinds his teeth and becomes rigid. So I asked your disciples to cast it out, and they were not able to. And he answered them, O oh, faithless generation, how long am I to be with you? How long am I to bear with you? Bring him to me. And they brought the boy to him, and when the Spirit saw him, when the Spirit saw Jesus, immediately it convulsed the boy, and he fell on the ground and rolled about, foaming at the mouth. And Jesus asked his father, how long has this been happening to him? And he said, from childhood. And it has often cast him into the fire and into water to destroy him. Now listen to how the father says this. He says, but if you, if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. If you can do anything, help us. I just imagine how Jesus actually sounded when he responded to the Father. It says, Jesus said to him, said to him, if you can, I just imagine Jesus, do you know who you're talking to? If you can, what do you mean? And Jesus says, all things are possible for one who believes. Immediately, the father of the child cried out and said, I believe, help my unbelief. And when Jesus saw that a crowd came running together, he rebuked the unclean spirit, saying to it, you mute and deaf spirit, I command you, come out of him and never enter him again. And after crying out and convulsing him terribly, it came out and the boy was like a corpse, so that most of them said, he is dead. But Jesus took him by the hand, and lifted him up, and he arose. Like I said, this passage has just been with me. And right after Jesus went up on a mountain where he got to be with his father again, where his divine glory is shining in front of his friends, he comes down back to earth. And you see how he responds to the people. He says, oh, you faithless generation, how longer am I going to be with you? And we see these two realms colliding. Heaven and earth joining together. You see, I've been in a, 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 a season in my life where, I, I don't know if you know, I... I've been dealing with some health issues, and, and I don't have answers for that right now. And I keep finding myself praying that same prayer that the Father said. He said, I believe. Help my unbelief. And whenever we come to the top topic about heaven and hell, I think it's really easy for us to, to doubt sometimes. To doubt that there is an eternity waiting for us, that, that there is a potential eternal consequence for those who do not follow Jesus Christ. And in those moments of doubt, we have to pray that same prayer. I believe. Help my unbelief. Because like Jesus said, all things are possible when you believe. When Jesus came, when he lived on this earth, he changed absolutely everything. He brought in a new humanity, and through his blood, a new covenant was formed with his people. 
with us, with you and me, a new humanity is ushered in and the kingdom of God is no longer just something that is talked about for the future. The kingdom of God is at hand now. We see this in the story of Jesus healing this boy with the unclean spirit, where Jesus, where God arrives and he is face to face with an unclean spirit, the devil, who has taken control of this child, who throws him onto the ground, who, who has tried to destroy the child. And what does the spirit do as soon as he sees Jesus? It says immediately, when he saw Jesus, it convulsed the boy. That's because this spirit knew exactly who Jesus was. He knew as soon as he laid eyes on Jesus that he did not stand a chance anymore. But that's because light will always overcome the darkness. That heaven will always prevail over hell. That Jesus will always be more powerful than the devil. And we have an amazing opportunity today, church, to join Jesus in his kingdom. Thomas Oden, a theologian in his book, Classic Christianity, talks about Jesus' kingdom. And he says that Jesus' dominion is called the kingdom of power in reference to the world, the kingdom of grace in reference to the church, and the kingdom of glory in reference to to the future life. The kingdom of power can be quickly summarized by saying that all things are sustained by the word of Jesus and his dominion, his authority extends over everything. Jesus was there in the beginning whenever God created the heavens and earth and his authority are over all things on heaven and earth. He exercises his governance over these places for the preservation, calling, and salvation of his people. For me and you, that is what he uses his authority for. To preserve, call, and save us. Jesus brings forth a new humanity in his life, death, and resurrection. And then the kingdom of grace, God is full of grace, and Jesus uses his authority as the son to pour his grace onto us, to bestow upon us spiritual blessings. Everything that we have received, we receive from Jesus Christ. The blessings that we have in our lives, the abilities and powers that we have come from him. And to summarize Odin's idea on the kingdom of grace, Jesus awakens, calls, empowers, and preserves the church. The Bible describes the church as Jesus' bride. And I don't know about you, but I bet Jesus would make an amazing husband. And as his people, we have to remember that the church is not this building. It's not that building up the road. The church is his people, and we are united in Christ. We are his bride. We are married to Christ, and he is going to do everything to empower us and take care of us. And by doing that, the way he did that was before he ascended back into heaven after his death and resurrection, he told us that he is going to send a helper, the helper, the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, a part of the Godhead, is going to dwell with us in the world today. Romans 14, 17 says, For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking. It's not about the physical things. The kingdom of God is of righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. When Jesus sent the Holy Spirit, we were ushered into a new world and a new way of living. And if the Holy Spirit is with us, that means nothing other than God is with us too. And if God is with us, heaven is with us. Augustine says, Christ's kingly rule is manifested among those who live in union with him. 
The kingdom has already begun, yet it is awaiting its consummation, and time yet eternal. Citizens of this kingdom, you and me, exist paradoxically in two cities, the world and the church, earth and heaven, present conflicts of power and future righteousness. Uh, Pastor Adam talks about this idea of the already and not yet, where Christ has come and already ushered into a new world, but as the church, we are still waiting for the full consummation. We are still waiting for Christ to return and for heaven and earth to be joined and for us to live as the way that God originally intended. And that brings us to Odin's last idea of the kingdom of glory. The kingdom of glory is that future fulfillment of the messianic mission of Jesus Christ where everything will be made right. Where those who believe Jesus is Lord will get to spend eternity with him. Where there will be no more dying. Where there will be no more sickness or illness. Well, there, there will be no more cancer where everything is made right. You know, I, I've heard an argument where some people say that hell cannot exist if God is truly a God of love. But you see, God is also a God of justice. He seeks righteousness and he is a God of order. He brings order to the chaos that is brought into the world by the devil. And as humans, we stand before God as guilty. We are not perfect. Because of our sins, we are guilty. And if God is in heaven and he is holy and perfect, then don't we deserve the exact opposite of that? Because I know I am far from perfect. I know all of you are far from perfect. But, remember, every time you see the word but or therefore or considering, you have to understand that something very important is about to happen. Even though we are guilty, God is still ultimately a God of love. God is love. And he provides a way out for us. He writes the greatest redemption story arc in the history of mankind. And when we deserve death, when we deserve hell, Jesus came. He went on that cross in our place. And in his resurrection, Jesus defeated sin and death and the devil. And he became the perfect living sacrifice for us. And so even though we deserve it, Jesus tells us that he is going to go before us and prepare a room in his father's house for us. When we deserve death, he goes before us into eternity, waiting with open arms for us to join him in his father's house. And if we put our faith in Jesus, we don't even have to think or worry about hell because the grace, mercy, and love of Jesus abounds forever. And to close out, I want to read a John Wesley quote. This, this quote was sent out in the, in the weekly email blurb if you get those, but I want to modernize it a little bit just to make sure that you understand what, what John Wesley says. He says, Give me 100 preachers who fear nothing but sin and desire nothing but God. Give me 100 preachers who fear nothing but sin and desire nothing but God. And I do not care if they are pastors or congregation members. This alone will shake the gates of hell and set up the kingdom of heaven on earth. You see, this power that we have as the church, brothers and sisters, is that whenever we live into this new humanity ushered in by Christ, we have the ability to no longer be afraid. To no longer be afraid of sin, death, and the devil. And 
we actually, when we come together in Christ's name, we can look into the eyes of the devil and he will be afraid of us. The gates of heaven, the gates of hell will shake whenever we come together and fear nothing but sin and desire nothing but God. The kingdom of God is already present. It is already here. It is already active. And together in love, we, be, we can begin to live in it today. It's a journey that I can't wait to take with each and every one of you. And it's a journey that, as a church, we get to live into as Christ bride. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we know the a storm, a hurricane had hit Acapulco get her. And we all also know that you have your people there, our brothers and sisters. So we pray for them. We pray that you may provide for their needs. That you may support and be with those who had loss of some members of their families and maybe their houses and businesses were destroyed bring peace and calm to all of them comfort them through your Holy Spirit we put in your hands Rosa Marina's family bring peace to them and thank you because her father is fine they finally yesterday got in touch with him and communicate with him so restore all Acapulco Guerrero and those families we ask you this in the name of Jesus Christ our Lord and Savior Amen my brothers and sisters may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ the love of our Heavenly Father the communion and fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you today and forever in the name of Jesus Christ Amen